So we're still starting recording, apparently. The transcription has begun now. So welcome, everybody, to uh, our 131st Wedding Online Sports Economics Seminar. Uh, our first back uh, solely online after an experiment with two hybrid seminars, uh, one given by Rob uh, last uh, in May, uh, no, late April, uh, and then one given by um, Fabrizio Colella uh, uh, last month in May. Uh, two very interesting talks, um, but we're now back where the hopefully the sound uh, works uh, on one computer and we don't have to have quite so much of a faff to allow people to ask questions. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have Dennis Coates presenting, uh, presenting through the smog uh, in uh, North America at the moment, thanks to those Canadians. Uh, and um, he's going to present competition in the provision of recreational services for profit and non-profit equestrian providers. It's not our first talk uh, on equestrian. Rob Simmons uh, gave a talk uh, some time back uh, on horse racing, um, so horse related, I guess. Um, but um, uh, Dennis, please do uh, take away your talk. Are you happy to take questions as you go along? Yeah, I'm, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. I don't think that I can see chat if there is one. So, uh, okay, I'll interrupt you then. All right. So, um, perfect. The dog decides to go crazy right when I start. <laughs> okay. Um, so, this is a project that is a long time in the making. I think it was probably in 2018 or 2019 that it started. And it started the way every good research project should start and that was there was a survey that existed and it's a survey that exists of both for-profit and non-profit providers of equestrian services and this survey is conducted um by did christoph no christoph's here, still here he disappeared from my screen so i thought maybe he got lost or something um so his group there in Cologne does the German sports um, surveys, and this is a component of that survey. And so when I was there um, with uh, my teaching obligations that I have in Cologne, um, probably sitting in a brew pub talking about existing data sets with Pam and Svenja, they said, oh, we've got this equestrian data set. And so it's um, multiple years and thousands of providers, and there really hasn't been all that much done on equestrian. So what can we do with it? <laughs> and so I started working on it at that time. And then it got put aside for a long time for various reasons and this is um having spent time in brew pubs with pam and svenja last january we decided to come back to this and so um this is my sort of hurried attempt to put something together uh for this talk in in part preparing for um easy in cork where a much more um complete thorough not completely fly by the seat of the pants presentation will be available so when i looked at that data i came up with a couple of uh, interesting questions at, at least they're interesting to me and if they're not interesting to me then you wouldn't be hearing this talk at least not from me so here's what these questions are as far as i'm concerned the first is why are there both for-profit and not-profit providers of equestrian services and i'm not an io person apparently in in health and definitely in health this has become a big issue or has evolved into um, a, a deep area of study about why are there not-for-profit hospitals and for-profit hospitals and and public sector provided hospitals 
all in the same metropolitan area. And so while I can see why there might be hospitals, it's not clear why there would be places providing equestrian services. And so when thinking about that, um, what occurred to me that would be an interesting question is, how are the prices between these two sets of providers related to one another? So what kind of competition goes on? If you think about ignoring the kind of motivation of the providers, whether they're profit maximizers or not, one might think that two companies providing the same service in the same town, it's going to be hard to justify that their prices are going to be different. But in fact, the evidence is that their prices are different. And so the question is, um, what motivates that? How was, what does that relationship look like? And there's a fair amount of literature that has looked at that question as well. Um, some of it by Christoph and his team there in, in Cologne. And an issue that has not been raised, at least as far as I'm aware, and certainly not in in um, in most circumstances where you have both for-profit and not-for-profit providers, is does proximity matter? And when I was thinking about this, because of some of the data we have is is geolocation data, I was interested in the idea of spatial auto regression. So what kind of spillovers are there based on um, nearness to one another? And then the second thing that was interesting to me about the relationship of prices is, does it matter what the, the mix of providers is and how many there are? So you can think of a situation where there's one not-for-profit and many, many for-profits, or one for-profit and many, many not-for-profits. And does that relationship or does that, that characteristic of the market tell us anything or influence in any way the relationship between prices um, that we would find between for-profit and non-profit providers? And then another question that arose for me is whether there was some sort of specialization or concentration in the types of services between the providers. And so um, one might think that a for-profit hospital provides certain kinds of care and a not-for-profit hospital provides a different kind of care, um, in particular um, emergency services, services for the indigent and so on would be more likely to come out of a, a not-for-profit hospital and um, elective surgeries and so on would be much more likely to come out of a for-profit hospital. And so, I wondered about that sort of circumstance in the context of these equestrian providers. So these are the kind of questions that motivated me. And then that made me jump into the nonprofits literature, which is not something that I was particularly familiar with. So I'm going to just say a little bit about it. Perhaps the first starting point is a paper by Kenneth Arrow from uh, the early 1960s in which he basically says what my question at the beginning was only related to healthcare. Why is there both for-profit and not-for-profit hospitals in the same market and why is it predominantly not-for-profit? And he gave some some answers. Um, I think some of those answers were a little snarky in a way, but um, I think that set off a, a much broader literature and Burton Weisbrod has has done a lot of work in that. And, and two, uh, one of these is a book and one of these is a chapter and an, another book, um, what he calls the three sector economy. So the not profit, the for profit and the government. I found a really nice survey by uh, Brown and Slavinsky on the competition between for-profit and non-profit firms. And the evidence, or rather the, the concentration here, the focus is almost exclusively on, on the hospital setting. Not entirely, but very, very largely so. So I'm going to give you a, some 
uh, a little bit of a breakdown of the survey that she talks about, and then I'm going to be specific about a couple of the, the papers. Uh, what are they, not she. Um, so describe several kinds of models that economists have come up with. One is a set of static models, and the argument in that circumstance is that the reason that you would have both for-profit and not-for-profit is because there's some sort of a scarce resource that limits uh, the dominant form. And in particular, what she says is suppose that there's not enough altruistic agents to provide all of the required uh, to meet the demand. So what you would have in that sort of circumstance is that the for-profits enter the market because the not-for-profits uh, are incapable of meeting the demand that exists. And and this is sort of a theme that carries through to different kinds of models in the, into the dynamic models is when you think about what happens in response to um, changes in the marketplace, what this sort of notion suggests is that any adjustments are going to happen, uh, happen on the for-profit side. So the for-profits are the marginal entrance into this market. And so when things change, it's going to be the for-profits that, that respond. The other thing that they focus on in, in these sort of models is the heterogeneity of demand. In dynamic models, we're going to have what it just sounds like, that the market is going to evolve, and I've already described what might happen. Um, and so uh, you're going to see entry and exit, and that it's going to be specific uh, generally so to um, the for-profits being the, the firms that are entering or exiting the market. There's another focus that's going to be on donor entrepreneur preferences. And the idea here is that if you're going to think about the comparative statics of the circumstance, then what the donor entrepreneur, the person who sets up the nonprofit, uh, what their preferences are, are going to be key to understanding the comparative statics of the situation. And in particular, are these donor entrepreneurs interested in uh, or derive utility from the act of contributing, sort of the warm glow kind of sensation that has been talked about um, in the public goods literature, or not? Because you're going to get different kinds of responses in those two cases. If all you care about is the quantity that's provided, but you don't care about your particular contribution to producing that quantity, so you don't get utility from the act of providing the, the service, you only care about how much of the service exists, then you might be a free rider on the provision of the service. Whereas if you care about this, you would be less likely to be a free rider. And as a consequence, that's going to influence your decisions, both with respect to how much and also the quality of the service that's provided. And then an interesting thing um, that arises is that you get a, a focus on how is payment for the service provided? Is it prospective? Think about um, or retrospective. So do you get the payment upfront or do you only collect it after you've provided the service? And if it's prospective, then whether it's a for-profit or a not-for-profit, you don't find any difference. Whereas if it's retrospective, then what you're going to find is that the non-profit is going to produce higher quality than the, not, uh, than the for-profit. So implications of these sorts of models. In a scarcity model, uh, and I, I mentioned this before, entry and exit is going to occur from the profit maximizing firms. And the rate of entry and exit is going to depend on the share of the market that's covered by uh, the, the not-for-profits. And the hospital sector provides evidence in favor of this sort of um, theory. Then what's the focus on, on um, the nature of 
the motivation of the suppliers. Are they altruists or are they not altruists? And, and I described this a, a moment ago. And so as we think about any sort of um, estimations or modeling of the sector that I'm going to focus on here, we need to think a little bit about or come to grips with how our results may be colored by the nature of the the um, preferences of the providers. If you look at the hospital sector, the answer to, answers to these questions are going to tell you different things about um, the relative wages in the two sectors. We don't have wages in our data, so we can't say anything about that. And then um, Ed Glazer and Andre Schleifer um, think about the choice of the form as a nonprofit as something an, an entrepreneur makes in order to commit themselves to not taking excessive profits out of out of the operation. So if I set up as a not for profit, then other individuals know that I am not able to, because of the legal requirements of a not for profit, I'm not able to extract profit from this. I'm not the residual claimant. And in so doing that, what that choice does is produces higher quality um, in the nonprofit sector than in the profit for profit sector. Now, the, the one paper I'm going to talk about more specifically is by Harrison and Liebecker. And unfortunately, Interlibrary Loan gave got it to me about 10 o'clock last night. So I only really have um, the summary of it from uh, the survey article. But here's um, what they have to say. So they're going to. And the reason that this is important is because it's really what I had in mind when I started this product project. Model price competition competition with differentiation in the products. So that's really what I think. Are the products different, and what's the price competition between? And their their sector is, um, as in most cases, going to be the hospital. And what they've done is they've said, well, let's think of the nonprofit as having. Uh, an objective function that's going to depend upon profit. You, you have to break even at least, that sort of thing, but also could depend upon three different things. And um, they're going to, what they do is treat them as profit and one of these, profit and a different one of these, and see what the implications of those circumstances might be. And so one of them is just the total quantity produced. So we're interested in making sure that we don't um, that we're able to uh, to meet our bills, but we also are interested in how much of the public service we provide. And so the implication from that is that uh, there will be a lower price in the nonprofit sector than um, in the profit sector. And the more weight put on the quantity provided in this weighted average sort of utility function then the greater the quantity that will be provided, that's sort of intuitive, but also the lower price for both for both firms, both the public sector or the, the for-profit and the not-for-profit. The second um, potential characteristic that they're interested in isn't the quantity, but the quality of the output. So they're going to maximize a weighted average of their profits and output quality. In this case, the price of the nonprofit and the for-profit are going to move in opposite directions. And I don't have strong intuition on that. Hopefully, after I read their actual article instead of the summary, I, I will have that. But the idea, I think, is straightforward that if they're focused on quality as opposed to quantity, that's going to be a restriction in the amount provided. And so, um, the the not for profit will have a higher price, and the for profits will 
take up the slack and then able uh, being able to will be charging a lower price that that's sort of my intuition whether or not that's true or not i can't say and then a third possibility for their utility function is what they want to do is maximize the quantity that they can provide for free as uh, in a weighted average with their profit so we want to make sure that we break even or or better but at the same time, what we want to do is provide as much of this service free of charge as we possibly can. And this sort of fits into, I think, in a way, um, the sport context in a way that other the others are harder to, to justify. And that is there's this big movement of sport for all. So how do you get sport to everybody? Provide it for free. And so if you have that sort of a notion, maybe this idea of uh, the weighted average of profit and how much of it can you give away for free are going to be, uh, uh, might be uh, interesting. Now in this circumstance, the more importance you put on how much you can give away for free, the higher the price you're gonna charge for the people you charge. That makes sense, right? If if you are trying to um, at least break even while giving a bunch of your product away for free, you're gonna have to charge a higher price to those people who are actually paying for it to make up the revenues to cover the cost of producing those that you give out for free. And then the outcome of this is that the for-profit is also going to have a higher price. So in, in this circumstance, if you were to think about um, the relationship between the price of the for-profit and the price of the not-for-profit, what you would see is a positive coefficient in that regression model, explaining the price of one with the price of the other. So that's sort of my run through a little bit of the, the health IO literature on the existence of for-profits and not-profits uh, and non-profits in the same market. I want to talk a little bit about the, the sports literature um, that focuses somewhat on club types. So Kirsten Hallman and Svenja Feiler and Christoph uh, have a study and of different types of clubs and whether they're non-profit or for-profit but the focus in, in that is really upon participation in one type of a provider based on the supply of other types of providers. So how many people join a for-profit sport club, a, a fitness center, say, um, when there is a nonprofit fitness center or sport club available? So what is the relationship there? not really a focus on the price of those two things. And Rasmus, Rasmus Storm and his co-author um, do the same sort of thing um, focused on Denmark, on Danish um, fitness centers, do nonprofit and for-profit fitness centers exist in the same parish. The question is really um, what determines the, the fact that there are both kinds of fitness centers, for-profit and not-for-profit fitness centers in uh, the same uh, small political jurisdiction in Denmark. Again, not a focus on price of the services provided. And then Leah Rossi and um, I think Svenja is a co-author on this paper, and I'm, I'm sure Christoph is um, looking at the question of whether nonprofit clubs are affected by the growth of commercial clubs. And this is a, a similar to the question that that um, was raised in the health literature, which uh, it kind of addresses where is the adjustment at the margin? If you have commercials, uh, commercial clubs growing, in in size and in number, what does that do to the non for not for profit clubs? And 
again, it's predominantly not about relationship of the prices of those things, but more about participation and and those sorts of issues. Then there is a, a small literature that's specifically about equestrian. And so I don't have the vaguest idea how to pronounce that name. Um, this is a study that looks at consumer preferences for riding lessons. So what are the sorts of things that induce somebody to be interested in riding lessons? Um, that again, not much focused on price. The closest to what um, the sort of focus here is, is this paper by Hess et al. from 2014. It's from uh, Sweden, I think. Uh, I'll I'll know for sure later because I have another slide with their name on it that says where they're from. I think it's Sweden. Um, and they do a hedonic analysis of the price of riding lessons. So what what factors determine um, the hourly price of a lesson on how to ride a horse? And um, I'll I'll talk specifically about how our results relate a little bit to theirs, but they have some of the same kinds of questions. Um, distance is going to be important. So the proximity question that I asked, asked above, um, the nature of uh, the community. So is it a wealthy community? Is it a um, highly urbanized or a more rural, rural setting? Things like that are the, the kinds of variables that they include in their analysis to determine um, the price of an hour riding lesson. So right, I, I like this quote, riding schools depend on willingness to commute. So you can think about a little bit what that means is if you're going to have a place that's going to have um, a lot of room to ride a horse, it's probably not going to be in the middle of the city. And so people who are interested in in doing that sort of thing are going to have to commute to the suburbs or have to commute into rural areas to do so. Um, not exclusively because they also provide barns, indoor facilities and so on. Um, and the, one of the key results is that the price for an hour long riding lesson is going to be smaller the farther you are from an urban area. and population density and income are positively associated with price. So the wealthier is the community, the higher is the price, the more densely packed the population, the higher is the price. So you can think of those both as the sorts of things that would shift demand curves outward and drive up prices. And the last one that I'm going to mention here is a paper that uses um, one of the three waves of this this data set, and I'll go into detail about what the data is um, in a, in a bit. But um, Toby Noe and Svenja and Christoph and I'm not sure if Pam's on the paper or not um, used one of the waves of the data, the 2013 wave, um, and they did a comparison between for-profit and non-profit equestrian providers. And the focus is on um, what they describe as performance. And they don't really focus on price here either. They, um, there doesn't, there's not much of a comparison of proximity to one another and so on. Um, so it's on the similar data. There are some questions that are similar, sort of implications that are similar to what I'm doing here, but um, the modeling is not uh, formal economics modeling, and so I'm not going to um, go into it any more than that. It's, it's really sort of, it's much more descriptive than um, what I'm talking about. 
and in particular it doesn't address the determination of prices and local market concentration and so on. So here's what I think of as the implications. Most of the sports literature on profits versus nonprofits is going to focus on participation with the idea about sport for all. Um, when they think about substitution, and this is really um, the Rasmus Storm paper, the substitution that's going on there is largely between organization types. So does this kind of organization um, replace that kind of an organization? If you have more of one, do you have fewer of the other? Um, there's not much discussion about the services that are offered. And I, I'm only going to touch on that briefly. One of the things I, I intend to delve into more is the array of services um, that are offered. I'm going to focus on uh, riding lessons, prices of riding lessons here, but there's uh, many other services that they provide. They just don't list prices in the survey for them. And then the key thing for me is that there's minimal discussion of price determination. So how does this market come up with a price for the services? And that's really going to be what my focus is on. So the questions I'm really going to be asking of the data is, is price lower for nonprofits than for for-profit providers or not? Um, the evidence on this is that nonprofits care about total quality quantity, and if they have altruism as a motivation, then uh, the price is going to be lower for the nonprofit than it is for the than the for-profit entity. So, when I look at the results what I'm going to be able to infer is that at least the results that I'm getting are consistent with this sort of a story. Is it a test of that theory? Not at all, but it's consistent with this story. Which type offers more services? So does a nonprofit uh, equestrian center offer more services than a for-profit equestrian center? or not. And can we proxy the quality of the center by the array of services that are provided? So um, Stefan is raising his hand. Uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Could could you, you, could you, what is the difference what between difference? a for a for-profit or a not-profit or a not in this context? Because it strikes me that in equestrianism, there's, there's a lot of people who are charging for services, which you might think of as for-profit, but they're not really um, trying to make money out of the business. Um, yeah, mostly the, the difference here in, in, in the data, oh great, somebody else's dog, not just mine. Yeah. Answering your dog. Um, the difference here is at one level uh, superficial, and that is that the survey was sent to the nonprofit sport clubs, and it's a different survey than is sent to the for profit entities. And in particular, the nonprofit sport clubs are organized under the German laws about what it means to be a nonprofit sport club. One of the obvious things is that they, uh, the way that they can raise funds and, you know, they can't sell stock and that sort of thing. There's no residual claimant on profits in, in the sense that there would be in a for-profit entity. Many of the um, for-profits are in the agricultural sector as opposed to in the sport club sector. Yeah, I, so I, the reason that Zilka's um, daughter um, is an equestrian rider in, in Virginia and she's been doing it for years and years and years and she works on a, in a, on a barn and 
I mean, they charge the services, but there is no way you could think of these people as being a for-profit business. I mean, they are they're, they're minimizing losses more than more than anything. So I would have thought that would be true of a lot of these agricultural allegedly, you know, quotes for-profit businesses in in Germany as well. Um, that's certainly a possibility. The the impression that I have from the little bit that I've I've read about it, and I and I think the Noe paper goes into much more detail about that aspect, and and would suggest would be consistent with what you're saying is that it's um, minimizing the losses as opposed to being a, a profit maximizer. So we're gonna we have our own horses, and one of the ways to allay the cost of having the land and the barns and and so on is to stable other people's horses here and to give some riding lessons. I, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, as opposed to the nonprofits, uh, which I think are organized on, you know, on the, the nonprofit sport club model that is common in Germany of the people come together to uh, have a rowing club. So we can't do it on our own, but we're going to do it in this group. Um, that's the distinction that that I think, but I don't really have a hard and fast rule. Uh, uh, maybe, um, maybe I will be able to answer that question in a meaningful way after I've dealt into it more. But yeah, well, I, I mean, I do think it's a very different. If you think of it like a fitness club, you can think of for-profit and not-for-profit fitness clubs, and a for-profit fitness club can make serious money. I don't think there's any, you know, for-profit equestrian organization that can ever make any money. Period. There's just zero dollars in this. It's all, it's all losses and minimizing losses. It's quite a big difference, I would say, conceptually. Yes, uh, I'm. That's all I can say is yes. I I think that you're probably right. I have to think through what the implications of that are for the the modeling and the testing, and I haven't yet. Thanks, Dennis. While well, you're there, Dennis, Carl has put a question in the chat, which is: This assumes cost is the same. Nonprofits may offer high wages for lots of reasons, meaning possibly high prices. Um, most a huge amount of the labor is volunteer labor in the nonprofits. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. It was kind of a following similar to Stefan, thinking about what the cost picture looks like across the two different sectors, which can be very different, I suppose. Fixed cost. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Shall I go on? Sure. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about the data. Um, so there's the sport development report for equestrian sports um, conducted, as I said, out of um, SPOHO with Christoph at the head of it. There are waves from 2011, 2013, and 2015. Um, the two sides. 2013 wave is what was used in the Naui um, et al. paper. And um, I th think there might be a 2009 survey that was used in a report issued by Christoph and Pam Vicker, uh, but it's in German and I don't read German, so I have not seen that report. I've seen references to it, but I have not seen the report. Um, and I think it's very descriptive of what the state of the equestrian is, um, equestrian situation is in, in Germany. So as I mentioned before, surveys go to both profit and uh, for profit and not for profits. And the, the surveys are going to differ to fit the organizational form of the respondents. So uh, for example, um, the for-profits might get a question about 
revenues and and costs and the nature of salaries and things of that sort that the not-for-profits would not that the nonprofits would get a question about what is the um, mission of the of the club and the for profits would not be asked what's the mission of the club so there's going to be differences um, in the nature of the surveys unfortunately the surveys also differed from wave to wave so that not all the same questions are asked in all three uh, which turns out to be a little bit of a bit of a problem because some questions that were really nice were asked in one survey but not in the other two um, uh, one wave and not in the other two so they couldn't be used and, and that's part of the reason the 2013 was used is because it asked questions that um, had not been asked before that that provided some useful information um, to what I just said. Both types asked for the price of certain kinds of of lessons. And um, they also asked about the kind of services provided. Now there's lots of other questions that that are asked. I, I think there <laughs> I think there's over 400 questions in in the survey. Uh, and I'm going to try to use some of that information and some of this stuff that I'm I uh, will talk about today that is is um, perhaps a little bit unusual uh, in this sort of in sort of a sports economics story. So what else about the data? I'm going to focus on riding lessons. So they specifically ask about the price of a riding lesson um, for youth. So that's anybody under 14 for adolescents, which I'm going to call teens. Um, that's anybody between 14 and 18 and for adults. So they're asked specifically about what the price is for a riding lesson for each of those um, age groups. They're also asked about what the price of a vaulting lesson is for each of those groups. And I'm going to focus on the riding lessons here um, in part because I haven't had the time to do the vault um, estimations yet to know what I'm going to get out of it. Um, and I think that there's an interesting story just focusing on on the riding lessons themselves. So the respondents, and remember this is the, the supplier, is asked about the price for a lesson. And they're also asked about the existence and the duration of waiting lists for riding lessons. So you can imagine, here's our price, and yes, we have a waiting list, or here's our price, and no, we don't have a waiting list. That's an indication about excess supply or excess demand of this service, right? So that's something that I want to make uh, make use of, and in particular, the duration of the waiting list. How long? And it's measured in months, so it must be significant time that you're waiting for these um, availability of these uh, lessons. The, the data also includes the zip code for the respondent, and I don't remember if uh, Svenja collected the um, latitude and longitude of the centroid of the zip code or if that was part of the survey, but we have that information. And the, the value of that is that um, at least relative to the the centroid of the zip code, I can um, compute the distance from one location to another. Now, to the extent that there are multiple um, providers in the same zip code, then obviously the distance is going to be zero. 
um, for those. But that doesn't have to be the case. And in, in most cases, it's um, a couple or three or four um, providers in the same zip code, but not more than that. And what I've done is I've computed the distance to the 10 nearest providers, though I'm in what I'm going to use here, I'm only using the distance to the, the closest. So here's some descriptive statistics, and I'm doing one of the things that I really hate about um, presentations, and that is that if you notice, the number of observations is all over the map here for different variables. And the reason that is for a couple, I mean, it's obvious that um, a provider may provide writing lessons for youth, but doesn't have to and could, while not providing lessons for youth, provide them for adolescents or adults. And so you get a different number of responses there. Um, And that's where the biggest uh, amount of the difference is going to come in. Um, so you, you'd see there what I have is the range is from zero. So the, the lessons are either free or mostly they don't provide that at all um, to a maximum of 120 for youth and adolescents or teens and a up to 150 euros for um, an adult have a variable that indicates whether or not the uh, operation is not for profit. And what you see there is about two thirds of the operations are not for profit. What I've done is for each of the zip codes, computed the price of the lesson on average excluding this particular observation. So we're thinking about um, Acme Riding School. What is the average price provided by all of the other riding schools in the zip code? So what you see is um, the not I, meaning this is the average price not including this specific observation. That's how I'm going to get at the idea of the relationship between the prices of the other providers and the price of this provider. And in particular, I've got this um, for sort of the aggregation of all of the other providers and then split out into does my cursor actually show up on your screen? Yeah, it does. OK, so this this youth writing price would be if I include all um, other providers in computing that other price, and then I break it down into the other price of the not for, for profit providers and the price of the for profit providers. So I've got it split out like that um, the results i'm going to report are going to be focused on estimations where i've split them out and naturally because that's i want to know what's going on between the prices of for profits and and not for profits in this way and as you scroll down a little bit you see the the kilometers to the nearest competitor um, lots of them are in the same um, zip code, but then one of them is almost 50 kilometers away from its nearest competitor. So they're spread around a lot. Then I've got the number of for-profits and the number of not-for-profits in the jurisdiction. You see that the highest is six for-profits in a jurisdiction and the highest of non-profits is four. And then these last four variables here, the, the Respondents are asked a question on a scale of one to five. How big of a problem is it for you, for your operation, um, 
because there is, and what we've got here, another not a not-for-profit equestrian group is nearby. A for-profit equestrian group is is nearby. Some other sort of non-profit sport club is nearby, or some other sort of for-profit club is nearby. So this the idea here is to address a question that I didn't mention earlier, which is um, a common complaint is unfair competition. The nonprofits are getting subsidized. Um, it's not fair that we as a for-profit have to compete with them when they don't have to pay the same uh, costs as we do, or they are getting government funding, they're getting donor funding, whatever it might be, it's not fair to us. And so these are trying to get at the question of have people expressed we are struggling because of competition from this other organization. Dennis, Carl's got a question for you. Okay. Sorry, Dennis. Um, just to clarify the um, interpretation of the not I prices. Uh -huh. So the magnitudes look really small. Is it the difference? Is it the average absolute difference from your price of everybody else? Or is it the, I think you said it was the average of the not I's. Am I missing, am I misunderstanding? Um, the average, the average magnitudes look really tiny. Well, um, yeah, remember, so look at the number of observations here for the, the one I'm circling. It's yeah. 4,400, but the youth riding price, the number where um, that I'm going to be using is 2,275, basically. And so what you've got in in here is a huge number of zeros that are bringing these averages down. So... So should, when should, I do they should, the they estimations, be they should be missing, not zeros, right? There's no comparator. So you, it, the price is there's zero. No That's right. That's right. The price is effectively infinite, right? Well, you know, there isn't. There, you can't pay money. You can't pay money in that zip code to do it. Um, I'm not uh, sure I'm following that, but uh, basically. Yeah, it should be missing. Yeah. There's, there should be lots of missings in there. That's yeah. right. If they don't offer youth riding lessons, then there wouldn't be a price here. But I've set them all to zero um, for convenience, and those will all get dropped out when the estimation occurs. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's the, the model that I'm going to estimate. Um, the price of this particular um, center at uh, in a particular year. Um, this is a dummy variable for whether it's not for profit or for profit. This is the distance to the nearest. This is the comparator price. And this really think of it as as a tuple because it's going to be the price of um, the nonprofits and the for profits on average excluding individual uh, number i here this is the number of competitors so there's this is also a tuple one for for profits one for not for profits and then this is um, a quadruple of problems those four variables that i described and i also include um, fixed effects and so the fixed effects are zip code fixed effects and um, your dummies. So the price is going to be the response from service providers on the cost of a riding lesson. Club is going to be equal one if it's a nonprofit and zero otherwise. Uh, the distance in kilometers to the nearest uh, competitor or actually between the, the geographic center of the zip codes. Here's the, the different alternative prices or prices of the other providers of the service, number of competitors or 
providers, and then the four problem variables. So I'm only going to show you one table of regression results. This is just the youth pro, um, riding price. And the difference here between the models um, is probably a little bit obvious, but um, in the first model, it's just everybody other than this particular provider's price is averaged together. In these two models, then it's the not-for-profit and the for-profit are separated. In this model, um, as I said, I've separated those. And then in this last one, I added these four problem variables. Okay. Key takeaway from, from this, nonprofits provide or have a price that is between two and a half and three euros smaller than for profits. Now, if you look back on let's see, this, um, the youth riding price, the average is 13. So when you think about two and a half to three euros difference, that's a pretty substantial chunk of the average price. So the not-for-profits are, are really um, charging a much lower price than the for-profits on average. And if you just did simple t-tests, you would find, find that to be true as well. So that's a pretty substantial um, difference. Hi, Dennis. It's Carl again. Uh, James has given me the nod that I can interrupt. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just wondering about price dispersion. Isn't that, isn't that a way to model how competitive the local area is? So, so you, rather than using, rather than just using the averages of the prices of the competitors, use the dispersion. It gives you some I, some idea of a, are they even are they compet are they competing? Are they really competitors? Yes, yeah, that's a good point, and I have not computed that, but it's certainly something that I can do and include. Um, my one. I mean, this is true of, of the mean as well. The dispersion one, you have two alternate providers. I'm not sure how, how much to stake on that. Sure. But that doesn't, I mean, that's not any different than the mean of the others when there's only two. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's absolutely something that I can do. Or, or, the dis, or, or, to make, or to increase the end, the dispersion of prices within X kilometers or something. Yes. Well, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but what I really hope to do is estimate a spatial correlation model. Yeah. yeah. And um, I hope to do that. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to do that, <laughs> but um, that's sort of the, the goal ultimately. Returning to the um, to the results, unless there's other questions, just note that the other significant variable here is the price of the alternative providers, and you see that it's negative. Um, what does that mean? A higher price by everybody else leads to a lower price of you, but that's predominantly driven by um, the nonprofit prices. The higher the average nonprofit prices, the lower are are your prices? Um, now I don't have uh, I have them, but I didn't include them. Tables for the other for the um, teen and adult, but I'm going to include them in my discussion of the results on the next couple of slides. So from the the previous slide, nonprofits charge about uh, two and a half to three euros less per lesson than do the for-profits, and that's relative to a mean of about 13 euros. If you were to look at the teen lessons, it's slightly over three euros for a discount, and it's about five euros for adult lessons. 
I don't, I don't have a story as to why that would be the case. I think it's an interesting sort of finding, and it may all disappear after I the sort of caveats I'm going to mention at the end. Um, but uh, so that's the result that it it exists and it's bigger for adolescents and adults that nonprofits prices are lower than for profits. Then the other thing is that one's own price is lower, the higher is the average price of, of the others, especially the nonprofit providers. Interestingly, and um, if you look at the number of other providers, at least in the youth and in the teen cases, and, and I showed you in the youth case, the number of other providers, whether they were for profit or not for profit, made no difference, was not statistically related to the price of the um, of the provider of the lessons. But in the adult lessons case, that's not the case, that adult lessons are more expensive the more for profit providers there are. And it's about a euro and a half, so almost 10 percent of the mean. Distance to the nearest competitor has no influence. Um, my hunch is that has a lot to do with the large number of zeros, so the large number of uh, situations where your nearest competitor is, competitor is in the same jurisdiction as you are. But it's consistent with what Hassan and his the co-authors found using their hedonic model of riding less than price in Sweden. They found that distance to the competitor didn't make any difference. On the other hand, as I highlighted earlier, the farther you are from an urban area, the uh, lower is your price. So what that suggests is I need to figure out how to relate these zip codes to zip codes of urban areas Mostly these places are somewhat rural. You don't find too many um, uh, equestrian centers in downtown Berlin or Cologne or something. Not that they don't exist, because I know that Spoho has one, because I've seen them riding the horses around at um, the Sport University in Cologne. And those variables that are, do you have problems because, and I should say that that the um, variables that I used were dummy variables. I created them, I, I created them by um, taking their Likert scale, scale variables ranging from one to five and saying, this is, a, we're gonna identify if they've said four or five. So the most extreme sorts of, of cases and they don't seem to have any influence. Now the caveats. Um, I don't include it on here, but I probably should, and that is that I was still working on this at 11.30 last night, so there's lots of potential screw-ups in um, everything that I've done. But the more conceptual problems are first endogeneity. Clearly, if we believe in markets at all, the prices of one firm are somehow going to be influenced by the prices of the other firms when there's only a small number of them in existence. So if I had hundreds of, of equestrian providers all in the same jurisdiction, then I would say, yeah, maybe the prices of one are independent of the prices of the others. When I've got three or five or at maximum six or seven, it's hard for me to justify the assumption that their prices are completely um, independent of one another. 
if we're thinking about the concentration of the market, the number of firms of each type is probably not a particularly good one. So far, I haven't accounted for the breadth of the services. And, and so um, I mentioned this a couple of times. There's 30 services reported other than riding lessons and vaulting lessons. And to be honest, I don't even know what about a third of them mean. Like, I don't know what drag hunting means. I, I don't know what that is. Um, and I don't know what the difference is between some of them. Like, um, what's the difference between um, cross country riding and trail riding? How how are those substantially different? But some of them, some of those centers provide one, but not the other. So I'm not sure what those things mean. Um, I included a variable that, and I didn't report it here, that was the number of, of the six basic youth, teen, adult riding lessons, youth, teen, adult vaulting lessons. So it could be anywhere where from one to six. And that variable was quite strongly statistically st significant, and it showed that um, the addition of one service type reduced the price of um, a lesson by about 35 euro cents. I'm not entirely sure why, what that means, but it was statistically significant. It is an idea or a way of thinking about the breadth of the services offered and the the concentration of or specialization of that firm um, that I mentioned earlier. There's no control for the stated objectives of clubs. Now you might say, well, I thought for profit or not for profit, that was kind of um, the idea. But in the nonprofit sector, clubs are asked things like, is your mission to provide, um, in this case, maybe riding lessons to youth? Is your mission to provide um, health act, healthy activities for seniors? Or to what extent do you agree that your mission is whatever of these things? So if the idea is to go back to that notion of the altruism of the provider, these are our controls, are indicators of the nature of that altruism. Our goal is to provide lessons, riding lessons, experience with horses to as many people as we possibly can. Well, if that's the case, that probably is going to influence your pricing. All other things held constant. And so I haven't controlled for any of those sorts of things here, um, and that may make a difference. And with that, I will stop. I think I got slides out of order. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Dennis. Really interesting talk. I uh, already sparked some discussion. I did want to quickly correct my own error before inviting questions, and that is to say that there has been at least one more uh, horse-related presentation in the Roses series, and that was by Bernd Frick on show jumping uh, way back uh, in 2020. Uh, but uh, specifically on Dennis's very interesting paper on the pricing of uh, profit and non-profit equestrian providers, any questions and comments? Income. Where do they advertise? Do they tell you? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Carl. Well, the, the, well the, sorry, the question is more generally. To, if, for for example, if they were really competing, or you know, most most of these things nowadays, you just Google horse riding lessons in Cologne, and you'd come up with a bunch of options on some. And they'd even probably be a horse riding lessons website where they all advertise. So 
if that doesn't exist, then because I was looking at the huge dispersion in prices that you had. Uh -huh. um, and that's just surprising to me if for a homo relatively homogeneous product. Um, and which suggests that they don't advertise in the same place or they don't, because otherwise, how could they get away with such variety of pricing? Yeah. Um... I, I didn't include it in in the talk, but I probably should have. I, I did a um, kernel density on the prices, and basically what you have is a spike with that's almost everything, and then a really, really long flat tail that goes out to those really high ones. And so, I, I you know, also did it with log price uh, as opposed to price to try to control for that outlier issue. Um, and the results are basically the same. Okay. But I, you know, you're right. I, I should I should be more careful in talking about the dispersion of the prices. I think I don't know how somebody could charge 150 when everybody else, is really charging in the neighborhood of 20. Yeah, <laughs> 10, yeah, yeah. 20. I, I don't know how that works. It could be a recording error. It could be, uh, I don't know. Could be a something fancy really horse. high end. I, I, <laughs> could be a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pete, you had a question? Yeah. Um, because it's kind of a unique product, is there any measure of uh, wait time, like people waiting to get? You said there's all kinds of questions. I'm wondering if uh, maybe nonprofits are, are are offering lower prices and therefore have a wait time. It, um, yeah, I, I mentioned that there is a wait list and there is a month uh, waiting time that's measured in months. Um, as this is one of the things I did late last night and didn't make it to the talk, I believe that there's no difference in the average wait time between okay. the for profits and the not for profit, not for profits. But um, you're right, that, that would be interesting. I don't think there's a difference, um, but I can't swear to that right now. Yeah, interesting talk. Thank you, Baron. Baron, yeah. Yeah, thanks for this presentation. Very entertaining. Um, I have two issues. <laughs> One is more related good. to theory. Huh? Entertaining, but not necessarily good. <laughs> no, no, no. For me, entertaining means good. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so one of my points is related to theory and the other one to the uh, data. There's at least one other sector in each country where Nonprofits play an important role, and it's agriculture in general and the wine industry in, in particular. So we see the coexistence of for-profit wineries and cooperatives, although nearly everybody agrees that the cooperatives produce poorer quality. So there must be other reasons for their existence than, let's say, spatial agglomeration effects or whatever. And one reason is in the in the agricultural industry, of course, that vertical integration is an insurance device for the producers against exploitation by end producers, right? Um, but another important issue, and I'm not sure whether you addressed that when you mentioned heterogeneity in demand. There is segmentation on the consumer side. There are people who are willing to pay for poorer quality because they support the cooperation idea, or however you want to call it. And that might be similar here. People might be willing to support nonprofit firms in that particular sector because they have a preference for nonprofits. And the second issue, I'm not that much surprised to see that the dispersion of the prices is enormous. And that has to do with the fact that, at least to my knowledge, most of these riding farms are located in the suburbs 
of larger cities. And that means some are closer to poor neighborhoods and some are closer to rich neighborhoods. And the ability to pay of the population in the poor and in the affluent neighborhood is extremely different. And that means those closely attached to rich neighborhoods can charge higher prices because they do not really compete with those in the less affluent or even poorer neighborhoods. Well, um, that, that's interesting about the, the wine setting. And, and you're right, I talked about heterogeneous demand, but I didn't go into any detail about it. And I suspect that um, it's a very similar sort of a story that some people just want to support um, the nonprofits in some sense. Um, and I don't have any empirical sort of information related to that. In terms of the price dispersion, in sort of in response to, in my response to Carl's question, I think it was, I, I, I think that the price dispersion is more apparent than real. I think it's a couple of really big outliers that are driving that as opposed to um, sort of a, a real wide dispersion you know, sort of, if you think about a normal distribution with really fat tails, I don't think we we have that. I think what we have is um, almost a spike above a particular price, and then one or two that are way um, way above that. Uh, but I will look and and um, definitely make sure about that in my. Mm -hmm as I go forward. But do you know the names of these um, outliers? It may be, for example, a former Olympic champion who can charge significantly higher prices than anybody else. So a superstar effect. Oh, that's interesting. Um, do I? I think the name is there, but I'm not positive. I, I'll have to look. But. Um, <laughs> There is some sort of identifier. Yeah, I, I have to. I don't. I don't know. There's there's something that may be their name, but I'm not positive. Okay. But certainly, since I know the the, I know the zip code, so I can look and see which the ones are in that zip code, and you know. There's at most 10, so it shouldn't be hard to, to nail down which one might be the one that's got the really high price. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more questions? Dennis, your camera. No, I can't see you. Maybe other people can still see you, but I can no, see you. For some reason, my camera decides to shut itself off. Um, and sometimes I can turn it back on and other times <laughs> it's like the computer says, now we're, we've done this too long and. Are you back? There we go. I'm back. Any more questions and comments? Thank you, everyone. Yeah, the thank you. Question. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Thank you, everyone, for comments. Really interesting paper uh, and presentation. And I look forward to uh, your updated presentation in Cork, um, which will be uh, in August. And speaking of future uh, events, we won't have a uh, talk next Friday. Next Friday, we have a internal uh, departmental uh, research event in Reading. So we're not having a talk, but then uh, on the 23rd of June, we're going to have Carlos Gomez Gonzalez presenting on an as yet to be confirmed title. So join us uh, once again uh, in two weeks for our next Roses online seminar. Uh, in the meantime, I wish you a fantastic weekend. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>